life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. Welcome to the Guy in a Dialogue. I'm your host, Shamiz the Ali, and it is a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Good evening to everyone joining us on Facebook and on YouTube. Tonight's topic will be modernizing healthcare in Guyana, the accomplishments and challenges. The Guyana Dialogue is being sponsored by a coordinating council of Guyanese based in the US, UK, Canada, Guyana, and the Caribbean. Funding support is by well-known philanthropist, Dave Narine from Dave West Indian Imports. Please welcome my moderators, uh, my moderator for tonight, Dr. Tara Singh. Thank you very much, Shamisa, and welcome to our viewers. Our panelists tonight are Professor Muniram Budu, Professor Narain Prasad, and Hello. Dr. Sanjay Ramkisun. Good evening and welcome, everyone. Good How evening are you? Good evening. Good evening. Our guest tonight is the chair of the Georgetown Public Hospital and advisor to the Ministry of Health. Please welcome Dr. Leslie Ramsamy. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my honor. Dr. Ramsamy, are you here? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Shamisa, and welcome to our panelists. Um, we want to welcome Dr. Ramsamy. You know, he has been very busy with Budget 24 and other matters. He has responsibility for the Georgetown Public Hospital Corporation as well as other activities. Uh, Dr. Ramsamy, it's a pleasure to have you here. I know I've been trying to get you a long time, but at least we are happy. And um, now that Budget 24, they are in the appropriation stage. You can probably um, provide us with an introductory and then we'll ask you some further question. But I want to congratulate your team for the laparoscopic surgery they did, the kidney transplant. You can talk a little about that with Dr. Kishore and his team. So go ahead, Doc. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as you rightly identified, the Ministry of Health will be going through the appropriation stage of the budget, the committee stage, line by line, um, validation of the budget tomorrow. We are thrilled that the government has allocated $129.8 billion for the health sector. If we really look back, the budget in 1991 was $22 billion. So that this year's the total budget was, 90, was $22 billion, which means that 2024 budget of $1.146 billion dollars um, compared to just $22 billion in 1991. The health budget in 1991 was just under $1 billion. In the health budget this year is 130 times the size of the 1991 budget. And if we come closer, the, just the Georgetown Hospital budget is bigger in 2024 than the total budget when I was Minister of Health. The largest budget that I had um, as Minister of Health um, was smaller than the budget for the GPHC this year. So. We presently cannot complain. I mean, you could always do with more money, but you can't complain that we don't have resources um, to uh, better provide services for our people. The, and, and I have no doubt that we have the capacity to perform at very high levels. And I will talk about some of that today. Um, 
The difference is that for the first time, we're having some resources to match the capacity. Um, this is the, the expertise and skills of our doctors, nurses, and allied health. And without going into much detail, I think because you mentioned it in the introduction, um, to uh, as testimony to the capacity that the professionals in the sector have. Um, just a week ago, about a week ago, the transplant team was able to perform a laparoscopic extraction of a kidney from a donor. And what that for the lay person means is that instead of a long cut, um, a surgeon could now insert the laser knife with a camera and essentially perform the operation with a minimally invasive technique, uh, leaving no um, permanent long scars on the patient. And not just the long-term physical impact on the patient, but the patient essentially could soon after, within the day, be discharged. Um, so um, we have come a long way, and that just small one example um, is a long, uh, from a long list of innovation from groundbreaking milestone type of surgery and medical intervention um, that we are capable of. And don't forget, not so long ago, just about six, seven months ago, we were able to um, restructure the heart of a patient after moving a part, removing a part of the heart and moving part of the atrium out and replacing it with what was a first for the Caribbean, a bovine uh, tissue, part of the heart of the cow. groundbreaking things. We have that capacity. Now we could add resources to make sure we want. The president, since he was sworn in, said that he wants us, that his ambition and the ambition of the government, the ambition of our country, is to have a world-class health system. The vice president, in talking about a world-class system, emphasizes a redefinition of primary health care. I'll explain that later. Um, and the minister in his budget presentation spoke about um, we are on the verge of a revolution in health care. But we will talk about all of these things. I'm happy to be here to update my sisters and brothers and all of our friends. Um, uh, in, in in Guyana, in the Caribbean, um, in the diaspora. So I thank you for thank, giving us thank the you. opportunity. Thank you, Rock. Um, I now pass you on first to our um, panelist, uh, Professor Buru. You know, he's not a medical doctor, but he's a professor in civil engineering. So, Professor Buru, over to you. Dr. Ramsami, it's good to see you again. Um, could you up update us on the latest on the new and upgraded medical facilities that, that is uh, ongoing in Guyana? Yes. Yeah, so by December of this year, we should be commissioning six new hospitals. I've spoken about this before, and these are at Lima, Anna Regina Lima, in Esquivo, the Kendron, um in, in Region 3, this is not far from Lenora or Parika, um, Diamond, um, Enmore, uh, Bath Settlement, 
and number 75. We are also um, soon after that, in around July, August of 2025, we should be commissioning the new maternal and pediatric hospital, which is a 250 bed level five facility. The other six that I spoke about will be level four. This is the level of New Amsterdam and West Demerara. Um, so the, that level five hospital um, will be um, commissioned as I said around July, August, and it's located at Ogo. Uh, we have also signed a contract and construction should begin anytime now in New Amsterdam for a new level five hospital in New Amsterdam. At the same time, we have signed a contract with an Indian firm to build a new hospital at Bartica. And by next week, we should tender out for a new hospital at Letem. And subsequently to that, we should be tendering for three hospitals, one at Maruka in Region 1, one at Cameron in Region 7, and one at Cato in Region 8. We are also um, presently discussing upgrading at Linden Hospital, at Madia Hospital, at Mabaruma Hospital, and at um, Kokwano. So essentially, we are rebuilding. So these are not rehabilitation I'm talking about. These are just new hospitals. We are rebuilding the complete infrastructure. And in fact, this year, we have $5 billion allocated for health centers and health posts to upgrade all of those. I should tell you that in the public sector today, uh, at Georgetown Hospital, there is a city. And it is the, and, and in New Amsterdam, there is an old city that um, we now have to replace. And at Bartica, there is a city that we will also have to replace. But the regional hospitals in Maruka and Letem will all have new cities. The new New Amsterdam and Pediatric Hospital will both have 128 slice cities, and they both will have MRIs. And I didn't speak about the new hospital, the Georgetown Hospital, but that too. Um, will this year we will begin to put plans for the new Georgetown Hospital, brand new hospital, not a rehabilitation. Um, the, these theaters will add, the, these new hospitals will add some 45 new operating theaters. There will be dedicated cesarean section theaters, dedicated um, uh, endoscopic uh, endoscopy rooms. There will be um, a cat lab at the maternal and pediatric hospital, a cat lab in the New Amsterdam hospital. And as you know, we already have a cat lab and a full cardiac um, service at the Georgetown hospital. Um, so we're rebuilding the sector, and these are not building the old hospitals. These are hospitals that are modern. Um, they will have modern theaters, modern equipment um, to ensure that as few people uh, have to leave the country and for much, much fewer um, reasons than they had before. So essentially, most of the services people need for good health, we will be able to provide. And whilst I can't say that we today can boast that the president's vision of a world-class system is available right now, we can say that we'll get a long way there by 2025. And we are absolutely unequivocally confident that by 2030, we will provide 
um, the people of this country with world-class health care. Um, incidentally, all of you should be watching the president this Sunday. Um, and, and all of our people who can't be there should be watching the president on Sunday as he commissions uh, the new pathology lab, the anatomic pathology lab, um, not the clinical pathology lab. But this lab is going to be um, providing pathology service, morphologic cytology and histology examination that are similar to what you get presently, what you could access presently at the Mount Sinai Health System in New York. Um, we are building this in partnership with Mount Sinai. So whilst the government of Ghana has invested in procuring these equipment um, at a cost of close to $500 million, Ghana dollars, um, the, um, the, the technical support are coming from some of the world's most renowned pathologists um, from um, Mount Sinai. Uh, we will be able now to provide diagnostic services to our people for all kinds of cancer. We'll be able to monitor treatment, both for infectious diseases and for cancer, uh, making sure that the treatment are, are working. We will be able to monitor transplant um, organ rejection um, after a transplant is done. We will be able to monitor treatment of the transplant patient to make sure they don't have rejection. Um, so we're not just build, putting buildings together and equipment together, but making sure we are addressing the issues that people used to leave Ghana for. And not just providing them with a service, but making sure that that service is of the highest possible quality. And so whilst we're investing the money, we are also investing in partnership, ensuring that the technical support is available to us. Um, so I mentioned Mount Sinai. I did not mention yeah. Northwell. Um, oh, yeah. Northwell is with us. We are working with partners in Cuba, in China, in, in um, India, in, um, in, in Russia, in the UK, in Canada, in the Caribbean, in Brazil, um, in Argentina, in Colombia. So we understand that whilst we could invest in procuring equipment, building hospitals and so that are capable of delivering world-class uh, health care that we still need capacity building a human resource and so whilst we are proud of some of our professionals uh, they are leading now in the caribbean um dr kishore uh, Passad and his vascular team transplant and vascular team are now among the leading transplant and vascular um, surgeons in the Caribbean. Um, the bariatric um, surgery um, for weight loss and to treat obese patients um, in Guyana today is the lead center in the Caribbean. Um, so so the, the work we are doing in neurosurgery um, is now getting attention from the Caribbean. The, the reconstructive surgeries that we are doing, whether it's abdominal wall, whether it's uh, the, the heart atrium, whether it, it, it is breast after mastectomy, all these reconstruction, reconstructive surgeries, um, are now possible in Ghana. We have the people, leading surgeons in our country um, or, or, or in the Caribbean. And now that we could afford to invest in the infrastructure, now that we can afford to invest in technology and 
maintaining our partnership with world experts, um, we are uh, able now to do these groundbreaking things. Yeah, uh, but I want to ask you now is that you have all these new modern medical facilities that are going to be opening soon, presumably before 2025. Would you have the full complement of doctors, nurses, and other staff? If, if not, uh, what percentage of the full complement would you have now? And how long afterwards would you plan to have the full complement? Okay, so the shortages of doctors is not as severe as it used to be. And that's because we have increased the intake in our medical school. We have um, continued the international scholarship programs. We will forever be grateful to Cuba um, because during the JAG, it, ha it started before, but during the JAG deal presidency, um, more than 1,500 of our young people went um, and study medicine in Cuba. Small among still go, um, but we have gone from 20 entry to UG because they had limited how many people they could take to last year 77, and this year we will take in 100. Um, Texilla Medical School, which is a private school, um, has gotten CAMC certification. This is the Caribbean Regional certification body and they have had uh, the international certification from the uk based international certification body um, and they are now um, graduating in 50 and 100 students half of whom are graduating. so in terms of doctors i think we have provided for a continuous flow of young doctors and in terms of migration of doctors, we do not have a heavy migration of our doctors. In fact, Ghana probably now in the region, which is very different from previous, um, they're not migrating away from the um, country. There might be a migration sometimes out of the public sector into the private sector but they're remaining in the country. In addition to that, however, um, because we had solved the number of doctors problems since I was minister of health, but the problem then was you couldn't lift the quality of care and the level of care that you provided because you had mostly junior doctors, general medical uh, um, officers. Um, not the specialist doctor. We only had a handful of specialist doctors. Right now, there are over 400 Guyanese special doctors. And I'm very proud of that because that program started when I was Minister of Health. These are cane cutters children. These are fishermen children. These are teachers children, public servants children. Um, so... The ordinary family now, it, it, it's hard to find a village or, or a street where a family don't have a, a doctor in, in the family. Um, but they are now our specialist doctors, over 400 of them. And in fact, as we speak right now, there are 297 of them that are registered in residency program in Guyana um, that are uh, doing specialist training in 16 different specialist areas. Um, there are also four specialist areas uh, that we deliver in Guyana um, for nurses. Um, so uh, let me say one more thing about the doctors as I move on from the doctors to the nurses. From 2006 to present, the migration, the retention rate for the specialist doctors had been 97%. So, and I know that there's a feeling out there in the diaspora and so 
that there is a huge migration of doctors. But consider that 97% retention of the specialist doctors in our country. Um, and, and not all of them stay in the public sector. They go also in the private sector. And that is okay because we are supportive of the private sector in Ghana. They, I, I would be less than honest with you, uh, with our Guyanese people. I'll be less honest uh, uh, to myself. If I were to say we don't have a problem with nurses, I think every country in the world, and, and, and whilst you may not have migration from America, you do have a nursing problem in America. Um, so I think, I don't think you could find a single country in the world today without that problem. We have a severe problem with migration of nurses. Our nurses are well trained, our nurses. Um, find a ready market in um, the international um, uh, horizon. So we, this last year, we during my time, before I became minister, we used to train between eight and 100 new nurses per year. In my time, we increased that to about 300, 350. By the time we lost government and we came back in government, the numbers had dropped again to about 200. And last year, we recruited 1,200 young people into nursing, um, into the nursing school. This year, we're going to take 1,500. And the president in New Amsterdam announced that any young person even if they don't meet the qualification, who want to be a nurse should come forward and we will make it possible um, for them to be nurses. Um, but like the doctors, it can't just be general nurses. We also have to uh, train specialist nurses. Right now we train specialist nurses for the NICU, for the ICU, for psychiatry, for emergency medicine, anesthesia. Um, so we, we have developed a program. And in fact, with Coursera, we have developed hybrid um, health programs, our training programs, where part of it can be done online at home. Of course, all the practical got to be done in the hospital. We will support the nursing school in this endeavor because we are procuring 15 simulation labs um, so that nurses can practice. Doctors also will have access to simulation lab. When I became minister, there were 11 dentists in this country. And because some of you may have been around in those days in Guyana, you probably could name the 11. Um, we have no dentists outside of regions um, two, three, four, five, and six um, at the time. Um, and, and two had one, three had really one in Georgetown who went over, and Dr. Ali is still around practicing. Um, we had a two in, in, in region six. The region five had one, but that was a Georgetown dentist. Um, we started the dental school then. Um, when we did start it, people said we were mad, but today we have 134 dentists um, in the system and another 17 in school. Um, for you guys that I see on, on the screen, since we are all from about the same generation, you know, most of us left school bright children doing well in high school, but we didn't have the options that the young people have today. Um, and I wonder sometimes that many people who never made it into the professional field, had they had the opportunity that we have here today, um, what would they have been? Um, but we are addressing that. One important area, you can provide a world-class medicine. Those of you who know 
who are doctors and who are, who are around doctors know that besides doctors and nurses, you need a large, well-trained, allied health professional. Um, in this country, until I became Minister of Health, there was people, people didn't use spirometry, for example. Respiratory medicine which killed most of our children at the time and for which many adults died prematurely from chronic diseases uh, because of respiratory problem. We had no specialist and no real program until now. Um, Dr. Bacchus, young Dr. Bacchus from Escribo, young female doctor, is now a leading specialist in this area. Up to this time, we have no specialist allergy doctor. Um, we are going to have one next year. Uh, in fact, in the next few weeks, she will be a, a group of doctors coming from the UK to conduct examination for this doctor who studied at the UK university. Um, and so we will have our first allergy specialist in the country. Um, so to answer your question, the human resource that must be reciprocal with the equipment and the infrastructure is not yet in place. But we, are, we, we have tackled this development in a balanced way. We, we are not building the human resource first, because if you don't provide them with the infrastructure and the equipment, they will migrate. On the other hand, if you build hospitals and equipment first, then there will be nobody to use them and you have white elephants. So we are doing a balanced approach. As these hospitals become commissioned, the human resource um, will be ready uh, for um, being deployed into the hospital so it's a well thought out program the vision is there the strategy is there and that's why i'm confident because even though we don't have all the equipment even though we don't have all these new hospitals yet, if you look at what georgetown hospital is doing they are already doing some of these groundbreaking things things that we would think that is possible only in the U.S. Um, yeah. Yeah. So All right, I, um, Professor. Um, um, we run out of time, but um, I want to bring in um, Professor sorry. Narayan Prasad. Professor Narayan. Yeah. Um, the last time we had a discussion on health, you talk about a paradigm shift. Yeah. And. While touching on the paradigm shift is the issue of integrated health. You can have all the facilities you have. You can build them throughout the country in every square mile. But if the people are not, if these facilities are not accessible to the people, and if integrated health is not applied, then it becomes nonsensical. So what policies do you have in place to have integrated with healthcare and to let the people be aware of the access to the kind of health? Okay, so you touched on a number of things there, but as you know, and, and there are other things you could touch on because integrated health means it, a, a lot. Um, so let me just say this, that health literacy is an important part of delivering a world-class um, healthcare system. Um, because as you rightly said, we could have the best trained people, the best equipment, and the best hospital. The US can boast of the best hospitals in the world, the best human resource in the world, the best technology in the world, the best medicine in the world, but they don't have the best health care. Um, so 
you and, and part of it is health literacy. Um, it's something we have to work on, and we are doing that right now, making our um, citizens more aware, um, whether it's nutrition, um, whether it's mental health, um, whether it is the vaccination program, um, take HPV. If every child is vaccinated with HPV vaccine, we can eliminate cervical cancer in this country within the next two decades. Um, but, you know, I could tell you that even though we introduced um, HPV vaccine in 2010, when I was Minister of Health, presently the uptake among the children 9 to 11 years is less than 3%. Um, and we have to do a better job educating our people. So that's one aspect, the, the health literacy. Um, we have to make people know their numbers, whether it's what should be your HbA1c, what should be your cholesterol? What should be your blood sugar? What's your BMI? That's all part of health literacy. Um, we have to teach people to, diabetic patients, for example, to look after their feet. Then most people in this country and in the US don't really look at their feet. I hope that all of us in this program when we go to the bathroom and we are wiping out after a bath, that we look at our feet. Most people don't. Um, and, and, and so these are the health literacy aspect. A second part of the integrative health you're talking about is access, being able to access the hospital. One of the great things that Barajagdale talked about when he talked about the redefinition of primary health care is that people have access no matter where they live. And Diana could say after we build out all these hospitals, um, we could say that by 2026, every citizen of this country have easy access. Nobody will be living very far from a hospital. Um, so there'll be easy access, but even with easy access, a hospital nearby, you need a modern um, system of uh, an ambulance system, a modern one, not a bus that we just write on the side ambulance. It, it, um, and with, with equipment, not just a driver. In the past, we relied on having a nurse or a doctor from the hospital jump into the, uh, an ambulance to go pick up somebody can't happen that way so we have for several years now been training emts um to, uh, to to be working with the ambulances and going and picking up people and provide that transitional care as they get uh, to the hospital we have to make sure that our health centers, because health centers that you might be familiar with from the old days, just a, a midwife sometime, or just a community health worker, um, and, and mainly focusing on antenatal care. Um, now there's a HEARTS program, a HEARTS D program, where complicated, complex medicines are being provided after these patients had seen the cardiologist at GPHCR or one of the regional hospitals. They don't have to come back. They have follow-up right in their community. Because in this country, almost every village, large village, and a combination of some of the smaller villages have health centers. Um, but we are now upgrading those so that they are working in close collaboration with the hospitals um, and so that people don't have to come every time uh, to the hospital. In addition, we are developing an aggressive, um, comprehensive home-based care. So Region 6, which had this program when I was Minister of Health, and then the program died after I left, 
Um, we, are re we have resuscitated that program in Region 6, where there are doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, pharmacists, dentists, or dentex um, that visit homes. Now, what are these home-based care programs? The home has to have a disabled person in order to register um, with the program, or a pregnant woman, or a, a person a baby less than 24 months old, uh, they can register for the program and then they will be visited and a, a, a management, a care management program will be developed. Some are visited every month, some are visited every three months, some are visited every six months. It depends on what the problem is. Um, so in Region 6, we have that team. Um, people will see the bus that says home-based care on it, um, and, and they register with their health center, which, which then provide the data to the um, health team that then visit. When these people visit, it's not only the eligible patient that gets to see them, family members, but you know, Guyana, if there is a home on the street that is being visited by a doctor, the word gets out and the whole community will come to see the doctors. Um, and, and where there are no health centers, we're building new ones. Last weekend, Mara um, was um, commissioned. Um, so every day we do this, we, we, we build out new facilities. In the integrative care that you're talking about, vision, hearing, dentistry is, are important. In the old days, you know, you have to go to the hospital if you have a problem with a tooth. Um, oral health and dental health um, were, were only available in some hospitals. Now, virtually 60% of all health centers in Region 6 have dental chairs with dentists providing care. So they don't need to go the hospital anymore. Um, no, I, I I know we are pressed for time, so I'm going to be quick on my question. Okay. Um, the you I I'm happy to learn that you have all these the relationships with different countries uh, who are participating in the health program in Guyana, but I'm sure you're aware of the book. I was a medical heretic, yeah. whereby. I'm hoping that when you have all of these alliances or affiliations, that Guyana does not become a laboratory for the specimens of experimentation on Guyanese, because we know how that works in from developed countries. What safeguards do you have in place to make sure that we do not produce medical heretics who are just there to up, upgrade their professional expertise there is one thing about the PPP government um, we have been elected to govern and to protect the welfare of our people we have never allowed uh, our partnership so I, I i i won't talk about the whole government i'll focus on health the ppp government whether i was minister of health or now minister frank anthony um there's only one minister and one ministry of health in our country. We don't permit, whether it's WHO or PAHO, whether it's UNICEF or UNDP or UNFPA, um, to, to come into our country, whether it is Harvard University or Columbia, to come in and take over. Um, I, I can't vouch for people from the other government. Um, I don't want to say anything negative, but um, I will not vouch for them. I could vouch for ourselves. And so in all these partnerships, we dictate the terms. Um, in all these partnerships, um, we know what we want. And people come here to, to provide training, provide resources um, for us. But we also... Um, 
we allow them to have mutual benefits. They could learn from us too, the way we do things. Um, I, but but we are not going to allow people to come in and just take specimens from our country. Um, we are happy for people to learn from us and to use our data um, if it advances medicine. Um, but we are leading that process. We don't want people to just come and we are just recipient of their knowledge. Um, we are gladly going to be recipients, but we also want to be givers. All right. Thank you, um, Doc. Um, over now to um, Dr. Sanjay Ramkisun, who is a heart specialist in New York here. Dr. Sanjay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to all the viewers. Um, Minister Ramsamy, nice to see you again. Same when, it comes, when it comes to BMI, I think you're in tech. Yeah. You're doing a good job there, staying lean and mean. Mine is 20. Very nice. Um, a couple of things. Uh, first, I would like to say kudos to President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, the Ministry of Health and all the hardworking physicians, nurses, and allied health practitioners who, who are caring for patients day in and day out. I can understand the task ahead and the task that they're going through every day. So kudos to them. And um, my heart's out to all healthcare providers and patients. I have a few questions regarding um, our conversation this afternoon. And one, with more complex procedures coming into Guyana will attract more patients from within the Caribbean. And so our president's vision of having a Guyana being one of the health, the premier health center for the Caribbean is within a few years away. Um, my question is, are we rolling out an electronic medical record that's compatible with other Caribbean nation, that's compatible with our private sector, public and private sector? And how are we, um, we will be challenged with medical liabilities if we're prov providing more complex procedures. How How is our current laws, does it provide for litigations for and against? Okay, so that's a, a, a whole lot of um, issues raised. So let me deal with one at a time. Sure. Um, so I'll deal with EM, the electronic medical record or the electronic health record. Ghana is still largely paper-based. Um, so even though it's been 25 years, 30 years since we've been trying to um, introduce an electronic medical record, and, and whilst we have some in place, so our um, supply chain has at least at the central level um, a, a modern um, electronic digital record system. Um, human resources is now um, also um, being uh, executed through uh, a digital system. Our accounting is done, but the medical health record system is still paper-based. Um, we have tried three, four times. This last year, 2023, um, we were able to use an open um, system from India um, at GPHC in some of the departments. A medical outpatient, the, um, now, right now we are, we are piloting it in the, the ER um, in obstetrics and gynae. Um, but that's a transition system familiarizing the doctor and getting them used to using an electronic medical record. But in, 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 um, in another two weeks, we are going to have a tender out. Well, no, we have had a tender out already. In the next two weeks, we're going to phase two of that tender. The phase one has qualified a number of the people who bid, 16 bidders, um, including two American companies, um, two British companies, um, one Indian company, and one Trinidadian company. 
Um, so um, these these companies are moving into the second stage uh, of this by presenting their technical. They have to do a demonstration. We hope that by June to sign a contract with the um, company that finally gets selected um, so that um, we can begin to roll out the electronic medical record by the end of this year. Um, in terms of legislation, um, we have an information, uh, the uh, legislation and privacy legislation, um, also the cover litigation, um, that is being drafted um, right now, um, and then we'll present that into Parliament um, very soon. So I think that covers your questions. Yes. Follow, follow up, um, Dr. Sanjay. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, I do think um, th those are key points and you're covering the questions. I have one follow-up question. You said that many of the physicians are working in the healthcare system. They're not leaving Guyana, which is a blessing for all of us. The question is when the public system becomes very well, we're going to have a public system competing with a private system. Which um, they're doing do you, now. This, do you see this happening very soon? And, this, um, and does I, it equal to better healthcare? Already. Um, it's happening already. Okay. Right. Already this is happening. So let's take some areas. So thankfully, um, at this moment, some high-level care for obstetrics and gynae being provided by both the private sector um, and the public sector. So at GPHC, some of the innovation and groundbreaking things that are happening in obstetrics and gynae are not happening in the private sector. It's happening in the public sector. And, and we should be aware that when you have premature deliveries, um, there is no hospital in Guyana um, that can compete with GPHC. Um, in fact, most of the private patient from the private hospital who um, end up with that problem of premature deliveries are referred to the GPHC. Um, so we're not uncompetitive when it comes to obstetrics and gynae. Um, and indeed, um, just a few weeks ago, Dr. Rosan, the head of the department, um, performed um, a real milestone surgery, um, removing uh, what they at first thought was a ovarian um, tumor, but turns out to be a renal tumor of, uh, with a kidney that was 36 pounds, um, 73 centimeter in length. Um, so um, these things are being done. In terms of cardiology, thankfully, all the well, three of the private hospitals um, now have a cardiology department. But GPHC, all the doctors in the private sector are the GPHC doctors. Um, GPHC now have doctors that could do stent insertion, angiogram, angioplasty, all those cardiac interventions. Whilst we do most of the open heart surgery at GPHC, we are still not able to perform open heart surgery exclusively with the local team. We are grateful the doctor Gary Stevens, you might know him, a Guyanese doctor in, um, in Brooklyn, um, who brings a team every month to do the open heart surgery. And we work with a team from Canada that does the pediatric um, surgeries. When um, the maternal and pediatric hospital is commissioned, that will focus entirely on pediatric cardiology, um, when it will be the only institution in Ghana that could um, routinely perform um, pediatric cardiology um, surgery. Um, 
and, and we presently have three local doctors who are cardiac surgeons trained. Uh, one of them, two of them from India, and one out of, of Canada um, that are back home and ready to begin working. But they're working with Dr. Stevens, and we hope that sometime this year. Ghana will perform its first open heart surgery with a exclusive local team. Um, and that's why I said before that we, we are doing some big things already. And that's what made me, make me confident. That's why we believe that with the resources that we have, we already have the makings of a highly professional staff that could take us to first world health. Um, and I've just only given you a few things. But years ago, when I was Minister of Health, I used to have Dr. Crandon, a Guyanese from the Maikoni area, who is at University of the West Indies in Jamaica, come for um, new neurosurgery. Um, we have our own neurosurgery surgeons now doing really, really historic things in our country. Um, more so than many in the Caribbean are doing. And, and so um, we are very optimistic. And, and I'm not going into all the details. I would encourage you. Um, I think in yesterday's paper, Diana Times, my weekly column, um, touched on some of the groundbreaking things we're doing. Um, this weekend, Miro will be a little bit more... Um, extensive and um, because to go through all of this would be too lengthy for a newspaper I, I will encourage you to look at my Facebook page by this weekend or my LinkedIn where we will publish the complete article with the details of all the, of the great things that are happening at Georgetown Hospital and I know you and many in Guyana would say well you guys are doing some fantastic things, but here, this is my experience because one of the things we 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 need to do better at are the little things. So whilst we have made some dramatic improvement in the big complicated things, we still screw up royally in the little things. Um, and sometimes it's not the clinical care. It is just how we talk to people, um, how we treat people. Um, uh, and, and so at Georgetown Hospital, what is now becoming famous is look for the orange room. Um, just as you enter the gate, there is a, 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 an office that is painted yellow, a green, um, sorry, orange on the outside. Um, and we have now a full staff to help people who have problems. And we'll duplicate this across the country. Um, so I, I, I hope I'm giving you a good glimpse of what we have. Yes, yes, you have. You've done an yeah. excellent job tonight. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay. Um, um, I go now, you, you make final point or comment because we're about to close. Um, Professor Muniram, your final yeah. comment or question. Yeah. Dr. Ramsamy, uh, yeah. every time you come on this program, you're very passionate in describing all the um, new or modern things that you're doing in Guyana. And uh, you've, you've provided a lot of information for us to be excited. Um, but when you describe that the president wants a world-class uh, healthcare system, what do you really mean? World-class in everything? Because there's so many specialities in there. Or are you going to focus on certain areas, say tropical medicine or something like that? I, I think it's world class for health in general. Now, we live in a tropical country and we suffer from a lot of the tropical um, diseases. Um, there are five neglected tropical diseases that still exist in Ghana, even though it's been eliminated in many countries. Filariasis is still here. Um, the, the, um, le um, there, there are um, many of these 
um, neglected diseases where we have reached elimination stage. By 2025, five of these um, should um, be eliminated from Guyana. Um, but we have to maintain a highly qualified group of physicians to deal with tropical medicine and build a laboratory that go along with these tropical medicine. With climate change, we expect more of these things, Zika, chikungunya, all of these things on top of malaria. Um, so we have to address tropical medicine. Um, leptos, well, leptosporosis is one as we deal with climate change and flooding um, and with the increase of um, domestic animals. You know, the, the American thing of pets and so in the home, um, we will have to, to develop this. The chronic diseases, when I became minister in 2000, um, accounted for 85% of people with the chronic diseases, it's heart diseases, cancer, um, the, the cardiovascular diseases, um, high blood pressure, <coughs> diabetes. Um, they died before they were 65, 85%. Um, right now, it's 58%. Um, so people are living longer with these diseases. Um, so we have to develop a first class um, NCD program that provide all of the screening services and so that you you have. If you, Dr. Kisunos and, 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 and all of you guys know, some of you might be referred already to the hospital pathology lab for things like KI-67 or CD4 or CD45 pathology lab that most of our doctors a few years ago never heard about. Right. And, and now we are providing those tests. So the lab that I'm telling you that the president will commission on Sunday um, will, uh, unfortunately, I won't be here. I'm leading Guyana's copy delegation in Panama. Um, but now the lab will be able to provide these things. So, so the world-class system means that the health care that people need as we live longer, as chronic disease uh, in Guyana becomes as dominant as it is in America, um, so, uh, we have to provide those services. Yeah. And that's uh, what um, Yeah, um, thank you, um, Dr. Ansami. I guess that what Pro Professor Budu was getting at, the ministry ought to define this for the general public to understand what you mean by world-class health care. Well, I, um, I think... I think Dr. the package of service uh, defines it. Okay. Dr. Um, Professor Narayan, your last word, uh, please. Yeah, you, you, you touched on the, a little bit on the interpersonal behavior of medical practitioners. Now, I know doctors, there are many doctors still today because I've, I've talked to a lot of people in Guyana uh, who doctors think that they are demigods. How do you how do you address that problem so that doctors improve their interpersonal skills well that is a very difficult question and i grew up in this country as you did and doctors have always been um treated that way not just that they make themselves that way we treat them that way um we are removing some of these barriers and I believe that we should not leave these things up to people's own personality. We should create the kind of environment and milieu um, to promote such behavior. Um, and so what we do now is we are setting up in the hospitals time for doctors to deal with families. We, are, we have something called the patient advocate where these report directly to the ministers, um, where these are people who represent the patients um, in, a, in, in the hospital, not working for the doctors and nurses, that bring the patients and their family and the doctors and the nurses 
together so that we can have conference. We now have for all inpatient conference time for patients and their family with their doctors. Um, we now, a lot of time people come to the hospital, they come to me and I ask them, what's the name of the doctor? And they don't know. So now we are making sure that doctors introduce themselves, that people know who they are doctors, who their doctors are. The names of the nurses, they have to wear their name um, plates. Um, so we are encouraging that. Uh, but, you know, I believe that for some of the technical things, we will have an easier time developing. This interpersonal behavior, this um, making sure that every patient and their family members are treated with dignity and respect. Um, we will have to ensure we put policies and guidelines in place to support it. But I, having said all of that, I could say that more than half of our doctors, more than half of our nurses now have um, the kind of relationship with people that we all would want. Um, and so I don't want to paint every professional in the healthcare system uh, uh, as bad apples. Um, I, I think that... Um, it is improving daily. And I would say right now that that is our number one challenge in the health sector. Okay. Thank you, Doc. Um, Dr. Sanjay, your last word. Uh, thank you very much. Um, wow, that was, that was quite of um, more than 50%. That's, that's a good statistics. Um, in the US, we do, um, we do teach the teachers where we have yeah. different um, teaching techniques, uh, talking with physicians. And I know 99.99% .99 of medical schools do teach doctors ethics. And so they are well-trained in this area, maybe not executed, but well-trained. Um, you touched on most of the things that I had questions on, but one of the things I wanna pick your brain on is if there's a plan for holistic palliative care so that we are all running at a pace where we're putting in defibrillators, pacemakers, ablations, open heart surgery. But we have we know that there's gonna be a time when people are going to die. And are we prepared for patients to die in a holistic palliative manner? Do we have anything in the pipelines leading up to holistic and palliative care at end of life issues and care? And, and as the population age, um, Ghana's expect, life expectancy is now 70, um, so, so, uh, close to 70 for men and 74 for women. And as, as it gets higher, um, more chronic diseases, palliative care is, is needed. And in fact, we are now developing a whole new area of medicine in Ghana um, for palliative care. Um, so in, in, when I was Minister of Health, we talked a lot about this, but we didn't have the resources. In fact, we didn't have the resources to provide many of the medicines um, that one needed for cancer. But now these are some of the, the very costly medicines that we have in the U.S. are here now in Guyana. Um, and, and some of the palliative care medicines and so that we need in Guyana um, are, are now considered part of um, what, as, as important as anything else. Sure. Um, so palliative care is now a priority um, for the health sector. I think if I were to compare the development of palliative care and where we are right now um, to where, say, cardiology is, we are way, way ahead with cardiology as opposed to palliative care. But we want to catch up very quickly. And so some of the work we are doing with, um, with McMaster, um, with Mount Sinai, and with Northwell is a focus on palliative care. All right, thank you, Doc. Um, we want to thank you. I'm sorry um, the program is so short for so many um, 
subjects and topics to cover. Um, it's still one hour. It, it, <laughs> it was a very stimulating and very informative um, session we have. And over you to, to Shamila, we have gone past by 10 minutes. So, Shamila. Um, thank you, Dr. Tara. Uh, we'll take one question um, from our viewers tonight. Uh, any comment on behavior, intervention, depression, and suicide, Madia fire, recidivism, contagion effects on the teenager? And I believe this is coming from Dr. Singh. He's a psychiatrist. So mental health is another priority area. Um, for depression, we have moved it out from the old days where it was the psychiatrist. And at that time, we had two. Um, dealt with um, depression. Now we have um, integrated into the um, health system where the doctors at the health center, the doctors at the hospital, and so are dealing with depression. And now we also have medicines that we could treat people with clinical depression. Um, young people today are faced with huge challenges, not the days when we were growing up, and yes, we had challenges, but um, the challenges today are enormous. Um, and getting support for, mental, for the various mental health issues that they face um, is, remains a challenge. But because we have the um, various programs for psychology, for postgraduate training in psychiatry, for social workers and counselors. We have developed an adolescent health program in the schools. And whereas um, we had started with just screening for vision and, and hearing and, and, and oral health, we now ha have mental health as a priority issue um, in the adolescent health program. So um, there is much work to do but we have come a long way in Guyana. We also have the Gatekeepers Program, which most people know as the um, fight against the suicide. But the Gatekeepers Program is a much larger program, and it's mental health-based, um, trying to provide that kind of support to the young people, to the young parent, to um, the elderly people, all of whom have various and different kinds of mental health problem. Tonight, unfortunately, time ran out and we couldn't talk about things like uh, how we're dealing with asthma, how we're dealing with, with dementia. Um, but I hope that we can get better again sometime. So we sure, talk sure. about these specific issues um, such as dementia. And Dr. Tara, I will hope that we will have um, Dr. Ram Sami back on the show so we can definitely, uh, you know, get yeah. some discussion on those topics, which I think yeah. will be very helpful yeah. for our viewers as well as diabetes. These are all things that our uh, people suffer and we should have more, yeah. Yeah. you know, discussions on them. With that said, Dr. Ram Sami, can you please give us your closing remarks? Thank you very much. I'm honored that um, the uh, Diana Dialogue keep um, bringing me on to the program, to the um, colleagues on the other side. Much appreciate um, the question and giving me a, an opportunity to update both our Guyanese people here and the diaspora on what is happening. Um, and the professor says that I always bring a very passionate approach to this. I am a very passionate person, no matter what I do. Um, but but I, I am passionate because we are doing a lot. But don't mistake that passion for a person who is unaware of our challenges. We have still major challenges. And yes, we cannot boast of that world-class system that the president talked about, that the vice president talked about, that I spoke about when I was minister of health. But if I were to compare my optimism today to my optimism in 2012, when I left the health sector, 
Um, I would say in 2012, I um, believed in it. Um, but I couldn't really say that I know that we will achieve it in 2030. 2030 was always the, the, the date for it. Today, I am not just hopeful. I am not just optimistic. I am confident and I am saying to all of you here, I hope I'm still alive at 2030, uh, but I can say to all of you that in 2030, when President Irfan Ali terms of office, because I know he will be returned in 2025, comes to an end, he can honestly look at Guyanese people, whether they live in Guyana or they live some in some other country, that I promised you a world-class system and that we have delivered. I know that we will do it. I know that you as Guyanese will be proud to say that the country of Guyana, which was the country that everybody looked to in the 19, early 1960s, um, in the late 1950s, this was the capital for health in the Caribbean. That by 2030, we could say to the, our, our Caribbean brothers and sisters, we have taken back our place. We are the Mecca of health, the capital of health in CARICOM. And that I can promise you, we will not fail. We will deliver a world-class health system to our people. I am absolutely certain about that. And those would be my closing remarks. Wow. Well said, and I am looking forward to the day when we can all uh, say that we have that for our country and our people. Uh, tonight, it was definitely an evening of very, very important things for our people. And so I want to thank my panel. I want to thank our moderator and our guest, Dr. Lelsi Ramsamy, and to all our viewers, thank you for taking the time for being here. I'm your host, Shamiza Ali, and this is the Guided Dialogue. Thank Good you. Doctor, you can just wait for a minute. Uh, the program is closed, but I just want to...